to hear oh, about you turn your neck. Yeah, I bet you have to it further.
Good morning. Welcome to Evergreen Church. My name is Katie. I'm the Director of Family Ministries here, and we are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. I have a few announcements to get us started, and then we'll get into worship. The first announcement I have for you, Kelsey is actually coming down the aisle with them right now. She has the fellowship pads, and she is going to put them at the end of every aisle that you are sitting on. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that fellowship pad, you're going to write down your name, whether you've been here a thousand times or whether this is your first time. You are going to write down your name and you are going to pass it down to the end of the aisle. You can write prayer requests on here. You can write what's going on in your life. Anything you'd like us to know, write that down on the fellowship pad. And when it gets to the opposite end of where it started, then you're going to pass it back so that everybody can know who they're sitting with. Okay, so make sure that you do this. I know that um, it might seem monotonous sometimes, but I promise that it is worth it. People want to know each other. We want to gain community. And so write your name down there, pass it down, and then pass it back. Um, You may have seen on the way walking in that there is a little carousel sitting right outside the doors to enter the sanctuary, and it had name tags on it. And so we've been wearing name tags for Pastor Mike to get to know everyone and get to know our names. And it's kind of caught on. It's kind of become a trend that everyone has liked. And so we're going to have these permanent name tags so that when we're walking through the lobby, when we're walking down the hallways, we can know who we're fellowshipping with. And so they are on the carousel alphabetically. That is how you would try to find your name. But if you do not see your name, you can see a pad of paper on a table right beside these name tags. Just write down your name if you didn't see your name tag, and we'll make sure that one is prepared for you when you come next Sunday. So it doesn't matter what your name or what your age is. Girls, you can sign up for one. Um, If your kids want to feel important and want to walk around with one, you can put one for them on there. Um, We want everyone to have a name tag. We want everyone to know who we're worshiping and fellowshipping with. The next thing I have for you is that we are doing a donation drive. It's called The Great Cover Up. We're working with a a nonprofit called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. They do great things. They build beds for kids in the area. They want to make sure that every kid in this area has a bed for them to sleep on at night. And so what we are doing is we are helping by um, collecting bedding, and specifically bedding for boys. So if you see any sort of bedding that you think a little boy might like, it could be Paw Patrol, it could be a superhero, it could be whatever you come in contact with that you think a little boy may like, We are collecting that through September 16th, and we'll have a little drop-off area in the lobby. If you have any questions about that, just contact the church office, and we are happy to help you with that. And then lastly, our Wednesday night dinner is quickly approaching. It is going to be September 25th, and it's going to be a new kind of little coffee house theme that we're going to do on this Wednesday night dinner. We're going to come, we're going to have really, really good coffee, not just like K-cups. We're going to have good coffee. We're going to have snacks. We're going to have some musical entertainment. Um, And it's just going to be a fun time for us to fellowship together. And so we hope you'll come. Again, that is going to be September 25th at 530. There's an area in the newsletter so you can sign up so we can kind of get a head count of how many people are going to come. And if you need help signing up, again, just contact the church office and anyone is happy to help you with that. So again, welcome. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning again, Evergreen Church. So glad you're here with us to worship. I hope you'll be blessed by it. My name is Terry Hartman. I'm an ordinary covenant partner of Evergreen Church, and I'm honored and humbled to lead you in worship today. So if you are able, will you please stand with me, and let's do our call to worship. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Would you join me in singing Amazing Grace? together fifth verse. of faith. Church, what do you believe? Our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. God's people from many places, but with one purpose, and that is to worship him together. A great part of that worship is recognizing how great he is and how much we need his grace and forgiveness. Because of that, let us confess to him our sins. Let us pray. O oh, holy Jesus, most loving Savior, you called out to Lazarus and made him come out of his tomb. May we... ...and serve you in newness of life. Through your mercy, O Lord our God, you are blessed and live and govern all things now and forevermore. Let us now confess our sins in silence. Amen. Please stand as we hear the wonderful words assuring us of our salvation. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. Before you sit back down, greet each other in peace and in love.
was a time that I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I Was a time that I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had I was running, I was searching But every place I turned for heat Left me more broken than the last Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I wanna go to church So one of the missions that we have decided to support this year is MomCo. And we had our first MomCo meeting this past Friday, and we had a room full of women. It was a great turnout, a great success. And um, as the ushers come forward and bring forward the baskets, you can see up on the screen that there are four ways that you can give to our church and be a part of giving to programs like this that we support here at Evergreen. But this year at MomCo, they have a theme every single year, and the theme this year is Wild Hope. And I love that they chose to call it Wild Hope and not just Hope, because isn't that where God meets us? Doesn't he meet us in the wild? That's where he met Moses. He met him in the wild. That's where Jacob wrestled with God in the wilderness and Israel was born. And even Jesus himself would go out to spend alone time in the wild with his father. And so I love that. I love that we are creating a place for moms of wild hope that in the midst of the sippy cups and the diapers and running to sports and all the things, that they can come and hear about the hope that Jesus provides for them. And so I just want to say thank you, Evergreen. Thank you for the ways that you are supporting this mission and that you are reaching out to this community. Um, there were so many women in that room that were not believers, that didn't have a church home and didn't have a community. And so we are providing a space for them with that. One of the exercises you probably saw in the video is you saw women bringing up pieces of paper um, and laying them in a basket. And so at the end of our time together this Friday, I asked everyone, what are you hopeless about? What is that area of your life that you feel like God just may have forgotten or maybe feels unredeemable? And we wrote it all down on a piece of paper and they came and they bravely turned it in into that basket. And so our prayer team here is gonna pray over that hopelessness that is in these women's lives. And at the end of the year, in May, when we finish up our time together, we're going to read those out loud, and we're going to celebrate all that God is going to do through that ministry through your generosity. And so thank you. Thank you so much um, for the ways you give back to this church. And just for a minute, I want to pray for that ministry. Dear God, thank you so much um, for Evergreen and for its heart for this community. Lord, I thank you for all the women that showed up this past Friday and will continue to show up to MomCo. I pray that you would use this church and all the people in it as vessels to represent your love. Let these women come and know you and experience you in a way they never have before. I thank you, God, again for Evergreen and the ministry here. And um, let us always be a church of generous, generous hearts, just like you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.
Before you sit down, let's stand together as we read God's word together. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And from 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. You may be seated. Wow, (laughs) that's a lot. (laughs) So next Saturday, on the 21st night of September, my son, Christian, is marrying his fiancée, Emily, down in Greenville, South Carolina. Yeah, did anyone catch that 21st night of September? Do you remember? The 21st night of September? Some get it, some don't. Do you remember? And that's as much as we'll do. Okay. We already have a choir. We don't need another one. But it's going to be great. We have spent months planning and paying and praying and paying and getting worked up and paying. I mean, weddings are expensive. Does anybody know that? Weddings are expensive. And they're wonderful. But they are expensive. And you know, there's, there's a couple of things that's always true about every wedding. Everyone looks great at a wedding. Have you ever noticed that? I have yet to see a not attractive bride. I've seen some not attractive grooms, but everyone looks really great at a wedding, don't they? In fact, a little girl was talking to her grandmother and she was looking at that. They were looking at the wedding album from years before. And a little girl looks at the bride and says, wow, who is that? And she said, well, that's me, honey. And she said, well, who's that guy next to you? She said, that's your grandfather. She said, well, who's that old fat guy in the other room? (laughs) Weddings have a way of bringing the best out of us, don't they? In fact, when we read that 1 Corinthians 13, it may have taken you back to your wedding day. It seems like that's a passage that we often use for weddings, isn't it? But those of us who have been married a while, in fact, Gail and Al Gardner just celebrated 51 years last week. Isn't that wonderful? We know that a wedding and a marriage are two different things. A wedding is one thing. A marriage is something completely different. And so kind of in honor of that and in thought of that, we're going to be starting a new series of messages today about, and I'm, I'm calling it house rules, because it's about how do we get along? How do we, how do we live together? How do we make marriage last? How do we make church membership last? What does it look like to have the gospel in every one of our relationships? What does it look like to live out the gospel 
in every one of our relationships, whether it's with a spouse, a child, a church person, the clerk at the store, the server at your table. What does it look like to actually live out the gospel? And I know what you're thinking. You're like, the gospel? Isn't that what got me saved? I mean, you know, you can think back to maybe high school camp or maybe some other time in your life and someone stood up and said, okay, there's two doors to eternity. One leads to Jesus and it's beautiful, the other one not so much. Which one are you going to choose? Well, I'll choose door number one, of course. And that's many times what we think the gospel is. And it is that, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than just eternity, although that would be enough. I like the way Tim Keller says it. He says, the gospel is not just the good news that Jesus Christ died so that I don't have to. Let that sink in. If anyone has Christ, they have eternal life. Jesus Christ died so that you don't have to die. I saw a great t-shirt the other day. It said, you only have one life. Make it forever. Anyone who believes in me will have eternal life. We don't want that to slip by, but there is more to it. Keller goes on, he says, The gospel is the vast entirety of the truth that since Christ died for me, I am a new creation. I have a new identity. I'm not who or what I was. I can be transformed in my character, my outlook, my responses to others, and even my responses to myself. That's the gospel. The gospel changes everything. He goes on. He says, the gospel is that I am so sinful that Jesus Christ had to die for me. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus died for me willingly. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. I can't feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. That's the power of the gospel. So as we think about what are house rules, what does it mean to have this new identity? What does it mean to, to live out the gospel in every single relationship in my life? The first rule is that the gospel changes everything. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes who we are, changes how we react, how we interact. It changes everything. And so the house rule number one is that the gospel changes everything. Have you received Jesus? Then everything is different. Not only your eternity, but your today, your tomorrow, your marriage, your parenting, your relationships, the people you interact with. It changes everything. The gospel changes everything. And so because of that, we're going to build some, some corollaries, some other rules that follow through that. And the first one we're going to look at, house rule number two is to dress right. Everybody say dress right. Everybody say, the gospel changes everything. everything. One more time like you mean it, okay? The gospel changes everything. And now i got to learn how to dress right. Because it's changed everything. You know, clothing is is one of those things that it's just sort of an amazing thing. Um, I grew up in the South. Although my dad was Air Force, they were from South Carolina. And so wherever we were, we were in the South. You know what I mean? We might be in Japan or Germany, but we were in the South. And my grandma, not my grandmother, my grandma, if you know what I mean, she was a good South Carolina lady. She had the go-to-meeting clothes. Anybody else grow up with go-to-meeting clothes? I'm wearing some go-to-meeting clothes today, right? I mean, you had your Monday through Saturday outfit, but you had your Sunday go-to-meeting clothes, right? Every Sunday, we would dress differently, right, to go to church. Anybody have a grandma like that? Anybody is a grandma like that in the room? You got your Sunday go to meeting clothes, right? Well, what we know from the gospel is that he says, get dressed a certain way every single day, every single day. But there are times when you want to dress a little bit different. I was in Orlando last year, and I went to a, a really nice meeting, and, and part of it was that, that there was a coat and tie dinner that I didn't know about. And so I got to the restaurant where we were supposed to be. I had a coat, but I didn't have a tie. And the maitre d' said, I'm sorry, you can't come in without a tie. I said, it's Florida. He said, nope, you can't come in without a tie. 
So I'm looking everywhere for a tie, and I can't find anything. So finally, I go out to my car. I had some booster cables, some jumper cables back there, right? And I'm like, this will work. So I just strung around my neck and came in, and they're, they're dangling down and all that. And I went to the matrix, and I said, how about this? Will this work? And he said, yeah, I'll let you in, but don't you start anything. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Clothing is a huge industry. Have you ever realized that? Barna did a study of this. This blew me away. It said the global total consumer spending on clothing is forecast to consistently increase between 2024 and 29 by a total of 488.6 billion, with a B, dollars each year. By 2029, it will be a $2.9 trillion business. Isn't that amazing? We care what we wear. In fact, Armani said it this way, clothes give people confidence. Clothes convey the perception of success and even improve our daily performance of daily tasks. What we look like matters. Clothes make a difference. In fact, Mark Twain said, clothes make the man. You ever hear that? But did you know the rest of the quote? Clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence in society. <laughs> I'm just saying. So when you think about that the gospel changes everything, think about how God has clothed us. There's several different ways in the Bible described at how we are clothed. One of these is in Isaiah chapter 61. He says, He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Left on our own, we read it just a minute ago in Ephesians 2, left on our own, we are dead. We are dead. We could go over to, to Sonoya and try out for the, the walking dead cast because we are dead in our sins and our transgressions. But because, as we just read, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Christ. He has clothed us. He's put us in a different thing. He's put on garments of salvation and put us on a robe of his righteousness. The gospel changes everything. That passage goes on, that chapter goes on, and he says, He has given the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Did you come in today? Under the spirit of heaviness? Are things in your world going so upside down and so inside out that you're like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to face this day? God says, put on the garment of praise. Put on the garment of praise for your spirit of heaviness. What does that look like? God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know you do. I know you love me so much. You gave me your son being, and the gospel changes everything and so even when I don't understand I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight because the gospel has changed everything so I'm going to choose to to put on the garment of praise I'm going to praise you in the middle of the storm it is well with my soul even in the midst of the storm I am going to praise you and you're going to give me your garment of praise as I give you my spirit of heaviness dress right Put it on. Take it. Put it on. Well, there's another place in Ephesians chapter 6 that Paul talks about something to put on. Does anyone feel like they're in a spiritual battle today? Does anyone feel like, oh my goodness, I look at the world, I look at the situations, I look at all of these things around me, whether right here or globally. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Paul says, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything else, stand. There's only one place in the Bible where, where God tells us to run. He says, flee sexual immorality. And everything else, we are to stand. And then he tells us how we're supposed to do it. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the gospel, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith, which with you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Dress right. Dress right. Because the gospel has changed everything, watch what you wear. Dress right. There's another place that we just read that we, it's not quite as famous. It's not quite as quoted, if you will. It's in Colossians chapter 3. And we just read it. He says, now you must rid yourselves. How do we get dressed? How do we get dressed? We got to get rid of some stuff because the gospel changes everything, but we're still holding on to some stuff. And so in Colossians 3 verse 8, Paul says, but now you must also rid yourself. In the King James Version, it says, you must put off all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self, your old man with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Paul is saying there, that's what you used to be. That was before the gospel changed everything in your life, everything about your relationships, everything about your relationship with self. He's saying, all of that stuff used to be true about you, but now you got to put it off. William Henry said, Matthew Henry says, to put off the old man is to take off the dirty clothes that are mentioned in these verses. I was talking to someone this week, and, and she had been a band booster when her kids were in middle school, okay? Part of her job as band booster was to fit these kids up north for their band uniforms, okay? So the, the kids would come in, she would measure them and get them ready for their, their band uniform. But there was one boy who played on the football team, the middle school football team, as well as in the band. So he came in from football practice ready to be fitted, and she said, you could smell him a mile away. Middle school boy, football, practice. Okay. So he showed up and he is just like filthy and um, odiferous. Is that the, the right way to say it? And I said, how did you get through that? She said, I put a clothespin on my nose and just got to work. You know? So many times we're so used to the old stinky outfit we're so used to being full of malice and rage and anger. We're so surrounded by malice and, age and rage and, and anger and slander. We may even take it in habitually through media. And we get so used to it, we become nose blind to it. It is so much around us that we just put it on because it's comfortable. We just put it on. It may stink. But it's comfortable. It's what I'm used to. And Paul says, put that stuff off. Take that stuff off. Get rid of it. Because what's house rule number one? The gospel changes everything. And so Paul says, because the gospel changes everything, you need to put off some of this stuff. You need to get rid of those things. They have nothing to do with you anymore. Again, Tim Keller says, to get rid of all of that, if your righteousness is only described by what you don't do, that's not the whole gospel. In other words, he's saying, get rid of those things. But he didn't stop there. He said, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. The gospel-centered life is much more than just taking off. It's putting on two. So house rule number two is to dress right. Well, what are we supposed to put on? If we're supposed to take off all of this stuff, I mean, it's not winter yet, but if we're going out with nothing on, it's going to get cold pretty quick. So if we're not supposed to wear that, what are we supposed to wear? That's where Paul says, therefore... Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, put on, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We're going to take that verse apart just a little bit here so that we know what the wardrobe looks like. So, so we know what it looks like to put on 
the new identity, the new gospel identity, because the gospel changes everything. First of all, he says, as God's chosen people. Now, we can get real hung up on that. We can get real academic on that. I don't want to go there. Guess what? God chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. We don't have the capacity to choose. Ephesians 2, going back to that, said, as for you, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. What can dead people do? That's not a rhetorical question. What can dead people do? Can they do anything? No, they're dead. God chose us and made us alive. And so Paul is saying, because God chose you, you now are holy and dearly loved. Turn to someone and say, you are holy and dearly loved. I can see you. Turn to someone and say, you are holy and dearly loved. Somebody needs to hear that today. You are holy and dearly loved because God chose you. And that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Because God chose you, you are holy and dearly loved, and the gospel has entered into your life and into your heart. Therefore, because of, since all of that happened, now put on, clothe yourself, clothe yourself. Choose what you will wear. Go into the wardrobe and say, that looks good. I'm going to put it on. Tony Evans says this. He says, put, on, put these on all day, every day, 24-7. Because you've been blessed, you should be getting dressed. Because you've been blessed, you should be getting dressed. Right? Right? That's what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. Clothe yourself with compassion. I like the NIV, but I love the King James version of this. You know what it says in the King James? It doesn't say compassion. It says the bowels of mercy. What he's talking about is the heart, the deep of the heart, the depth of the heart. My grandma used to always say, bless her heart. If she was King James, she would have to say, bless her bowels. It just sort of loses something, you know. Ew, it's kind of gross. But what he's saying is the very, very depths. Put on compassion to your very, very, very depth. What does that look like as we live as a church? What does it look like as we live in a family? What does it look like as we live in a neighborhood, as we interact with people who are, who are believers and non-believers? What does it look like? Well, Jesus gives us a picture of this. In Matthew, he says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Same word. A depth of compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let me just ask you, who in your world needs a shepherd? Does your neighbor know Jesus the way that you know Jesus? They need a shepherd. Does that person at the grocery store know Jesus the way that you know Jesus? They need a shepherd. Do the people in your family know Jesus the way that you know Jesus? They need a shepherd. You see, that's what compassion looks like. It doesn't say, yuck. It says, let me teach you. Let me show you my shepherd. You see, that's what it means when the gospel changes everything. It changes the way we see the world, the way we interact with the world, the way we interact with one another. We are full of compassion in our homes, in our church, in all of our relationships. Compassion. Well, that compassion leads to kindness. Kindness. Therefore, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness. Kindness. That word in the Greek, krestota, it's a sweet disposition. You know, I love this church. There are so many kind, kind, kind people here. This church exudes kindness in so many different ways. Your families, as I'm around them, exude that kind of kindness. But we all know kindness comes at a cost. There's a story about this in the Old Testament. It's in 2 Samuel. 
And remember, we've been talking a little bit about David in the, in the last months or so. And David, remember, David had a very, very um, tense relationship with Saul, King Saul. And, well, Saul wanted to kill him. You know, we, we may not get along, but nobody is out trying to throw spears at us and stuff, right? The, it, was, it, was, it was on. And Saul had a son named Jonathan, and Saul and Jonathan were both killed in the same battle. Um, Saul killed himself, and Jonathan was killed in the same battle. Well, David rises to the throne, and back in that day, you wanted to get rid of anyone who was in the bloodline of the former king because they could try and raise an army and usurp your authority and all that kind of stuff. And one day, David, who's a man after God's own heart, a man who has experienced the gospel as much as he could, the, the, the one who knew he was God's chosen one, God's favored one, and David is sitting there one day and he says out loud, is there anyone I can show God's kindness to? Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show the kindness for Jonathan's sake? And somebody in the court says, well, there is this one guy. His name is Mephibosheth. Don't say that three times in a row. His name is Mephibosheth. But he's lame. You see, when, when David came in to take over, Mephibosheth was just a child and his nurse in her hurry to get out because she figured everybody would be killed. She dropped him and broke his feet and he was lame for the rest of his life. And David says, bring him here. And everyone thought when he said, bring him here, he was going to kill him because he was in line of Saul. And you know what David said? He said, I want to show God's kindness to you. I don't have to do this. But I want to show you, God, I want to give you back everything of your grandfather's land. And I want you to be at my table every single day. You see, that cost David to show that kind of kindness. But David had experienced enough of God's changing love to say, I can do no less. How about you? Is there anyone in your circle Anyone in your family, anyone in this church, anyone that you come in contact with that you need to show that kind of kindness to. It is costly. But what's rule number one? The gospel changes everything. Albert Schweitzer said this, just as the sun melts the ice, kindness and compassion melts hostility. C.S. Lewis, Dwight Moody said this, kindness has converted more people than zeal. God uses kindness to show his mercies. You're a kindness conduit because of what Jesus has done for you. Kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. But it won't be easy because we have a very real enemy who wants to block Anything leading to God. And that's why Romans 2, 4 says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to the gospel, repentance. I love that that's Romans 2, 4, because it hits you upside the head like a two by four. You'll remember that. <clears throat> Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility. 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 Mm. Again, in the King James, it says, humbleness of mind. Humility starts here. In fact, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, humility, C.S. Lewis says, is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. Some interesting trivia. Back in that day, there was no Greek word for humble or humility. It was considered something so terrible that no one would ever want to use that word. And yet in Philippians 2, we read that Jesus Christ came and he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Our hope is in his humility. I like the way Charles Stanley said it. He said, Jesus took a word of disgrace and made it into a word of his grace. Humility, humility. 
He goes on, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Gentleness is meekness. Meekness, it's literally translated meekness. I was thinking of the perfect picture of what it means to to be meek. And I thought of my sister's horse. My sister raises beautiful, um, full-blooded Oldenburgers, if you, if you follow horses. They're huge horses. They're not like draft horses. They just look like giant horses, okay? Her biggest one, his name is Alex, and he is 19 hands tall at the shoulder, okay? If you know horses, you're like, whoa, that's a big horse. If you don't know, every hand is about four inches, and so at the shoulder, the horse is my height, six foot four, at the shoulder, And then his head goes up from there. He is a huge animal. He is a scary animal, but he is a sweet horse, if you know him. And under saddle, when he's doing his dressage thing, he is absolutely beautiful. And because he is so big, because he's so powerful, because he is so strong, he is so valuable. That is meekness. Meekness is literally bridled strength. Charles again says, meek people are powerful people under God's control. Clothe yourself with that kind of meekness to say, Jesus, you've given me all of this. How would you use me? What would you do with me? Meekness. Anybody remember the Chronicles of Narnia? Remember Aslan? Remember when the little boy saw Aslan for the first time? He says, is he safe? Because he was so huge. He says, safe, of course not. He isn't, he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Jesus Christ, full of humility and full of meekness, gave himself for you. Can we do any less for each other? And finally, patience. Clothe yourself with patience. Patience comes from this big word, macrothume. Um, You you might know that word, macro as in huge or long, thume as in what's a word that we get from thume. You put your coffee in it. Thermos, right? Thermos. Um, Long patience. Um, Originally, what it means is quick to get hot or, or huge hot. And I wonder how many of us have an anger problem. How many of us get hot very, very quickly? What Paul is saying here is because of what Jesus has done for us, we are long to get angry. We are full of patience. Psalm 4 says, in your anger, do not sin. In 1 Corinthians, it says, love is patient, love is kind. That's what it means to get dressed. That's what it means to step out in that kind of love that we just read about. Very quickly, there are two other things that this passage teaches us, though. Number one, house rule, the gospel changes everything. The second house rule is to dress right. But the second part of the second house rule is to forgive fashion faux pas. Forgive fashion faux pas. Look at what he says in verse 13. Bear with each other. And forgive one another. You may have been reacting to the gospel a lot longer than somebody else. They're not there yet. You need to forgive them of that. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I like the way Mark Lowry said it. He said, the church and our families are a lot like Noah's Ark. If it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the stench inside. Who do we need to show this kind of love to? Bear with each other and forgive. You say, well, I've already forgiven a hundred times. They keep doing the same thing. Well, that's why Paul says, just as the Lord forgave you. What What did the Lord forgive you? How much? Is there anything that he has not forgiven you? Is there anything at all that he is holding on to and saying, ah, I, this over here, that's fine, but this, no, I won't, for, no. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. 
You see why the gospel changes everything? If you have said yes to the gospel, then you have said yes to his forgiveness. It means that you are willing to forgive just as the Lord forgave you. You see, that's why marriages are, are expensive. Why weddings are expensive, but marriages are hard. That's why having kids is one thing, raising kids is another. That's why joining a church is one thing and being in a church is something completely different. That's why having a friend and being a friend is so different. Because you see, relationships are not based on perfection, but on forgiveness. But on forgiveness. So I would ask you today, have you been forgiven? Have you accepted what Jesus Christ has done for you? If so, you've responded to the gospel. And house rule number one is what? The gospel changes everything. So let me ask you, are you getting dressed every day? Are you wearing the gospel into every single relationship, every single situation, every single moment of every single day? If not, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, as Proverbs says. Acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. Trust in him. You've trusted him for your eternity. Trust him for your today and tomorrow. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we are so grateful. We are grateful for your word. You could have easily just created everything and walked away. But because of your great love for us, you gave yourself for us willingly. And so, Father, today I pray that you would, that you would shine your Holy Spirit light through your word into our lives. Show us where we need more compassion, where we need more humility, where we need to get dressed in everything that you've given to us. And this passage ends up with, and over all of these things, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And so, Father, I pray for every family here today that knows you, that we would put on love for one another. I pray for our church, Lord, that we would put on love for one another. I pray for all of our relationships, that we would be known for the love that we have one for another and for others as well. Lord, show us what it means to truly dress in you to put off the old, to put on the new, and to live in you. Thank you, dear Jesus, that the gospel changes everything. It's in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand for our closing hymn. <laughs> Let's sing together, love divine, all loves excelling.
the Bible it says, are any of you sick or any of you in need? Come, have the elders lay their hands on you and pray over you. Our elders will be up front and we would love to pray over you and with you. If you're wondering more about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to to get that gospel that changes everything, come, we would love to talk to you about that and pray over you. And now receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen and amen.